Hello everybody, how are you all doing? Uh, this is episode four of Loose Lips. Uh, my guest who will be joining us shortly is going to be Claire Scott, who's just joined. Oi, oi, how are you doing, Claire? Nice one, nice one. Uh, if you want to send me a request and come through. But yeah, it's been amazing so far. I've been loving it. Woo! Just connecting through the power of technology. Oh. Hey, up, my love. Hello, how are you? I'm good, yeah, how are you? Somebody that can talk more than me. Like, this is a marathon of mouthing off. I didn't realise until I just went and fed me cat Sheila and then went to the toilet. And that's when I was like, you know, like an adrenaline dump. And you're like, whoa, like, I better stand up and get chatting again. Like, I'm wow. going to sleep well tonight. You will, you will. You might have a sore throat, sound all like gravelly and sexy. Yeah, oh, yeah, my body white voice. That's what I'm going for. When I when I DJ, me out me outro is uh do you watch Friends? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Like like everyone should watch Friends, but there's a few there's a few critics out there. I've lived my life watching Friends. Yeah, but there's a there's a few critics out there who don't like Friends and uh, then we, yeah, we, we, we avoid them. We avoid them. Pull it. Like, like, what else is there to watch on Sky on a Sunday? Mate, but like, so, right? So the reason I bring friends up is when I end my DJ sets, I do, you know, when Phoebe had a cold and she went, thank you, my babies. Thank, yes, I... <laughs> thank you, my babies. So that's what I probably like sound like with like my husky, like dried out voice. And we're like, thank you, everybody. Good husk. But like... Yeah, like, how can you not watch me? I used to, right? When Friends was on back in the day, yeah. I'd watch it, and then I'd watch it on Plus One, and then my mum would go out, and then I'd watch it again on E4, because it repeated an hour later, and then I'd catch the earlier on E4, I'd watch the two again, and then my mum would come back, and I'd be like, oh, there's no one, should we watch Friends? And she knew I'd watched it, she like, apparently... Like, she's... that is extreme. Oh, you know, me, me and Friends, honestly, like, I am obsessed, like, it's, the, it's so good. Like, when Take That broke up, they had to have a health line for people like you, but about Take That. <laughs> <laughs> this is why they can never take friends off the telly, because they'd have to set up a health line for you. There were, well, it, it, it came off telly. I didn't know what to do. I had to go outside and stuff. <laughs> and do you know, you know the game Heads Up? Yeah, yeah. There is a friends, like, deck on Heads Up. What, as in, like, on quotes or? Yeah, oh. in, yeah you, the, there's a friends deck. Honestly, on heads up, that is true. I know what you're going to be doing after this. Ah, <laughs> well, we'll be Googling that. Because there's a thing here, there's a, a Lego, when they're all at Central Park, they're all little cute characters and that. But I want that. I'm going to get two copies. So I want... Stop it, apart from, like, there's a couple of little bits that you see and there's, like, a, a computer from, like, 1992, which is still dial-up or whatever, and you're like... Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's still quite relevant, isn't it? Mate, honestly, it's the best show. It is the best show. I love it. And if they dare take it off Netflix, oh, you get on this, right? I was I watching Mighty Boosh overnight. No, and, that's uh, weird. That, I mean, that's even weird. I tried that a lot of years ago, the Mighty Boosh. The but... Mighty Boosh is incredible. <laughs> that is, it is something else, isn't it? The Mighty Boosh is incredible. And I was watching uh, series one, and I fell asleep, and then I woke up, and Netflix had took it off. What did you do? Do you know Netflix? what I mean? How long did I sleep for? You've ruined the life of millions because you, you were... Um... Netflix, I oh, bloody Netflix. Bloody well, it's all, right, it's all right, Netflix. It goes in fits and starts, I think, though. But then, yeah, like, I do, like, when I'm watching telly, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the zone. I feel a bit guilty sometimes watching telly, though, do you? I feel, I know what you mean, especially if it's a show that I've watched. Like, when I'm watching The Office, I'm like, I've seen this too much. There's more stuff that I should be doing. And then I'm like, yeah, but you're learning. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I am. I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> but there's certain things, like The Office is, and actually, the in-betweeners, I could just watch, like, I just think they're hilarious. Yeah, they're so good throwaway. Like, it's good background when you're cooking and that, and you're like, don't need to know what's happening because you know what's happening. But then when you sit down, you're watching, and because we're only half hour, hey, then you're like, I might as well see series off. And then you're done. Alexa, 
I'm going to manipulate you. <laughs> I just should know that one. Anyway, so you need to get a, 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 a and then you need to get Alanis Morissette, Jackie's Little Pills playing, and then you can, I used to do all my housework, like seriously, all my life I've done my housework to that particular album, and that is pretty good for cooking. Oh, also Fleetwood Mac. For cooking? Yeah! Really? I love a bit, I love a bit of Fleetwood Mac. I love Fleetwood, but I'd never think for cooking. Yeah. You know, if, if you're doing something quite dangerous in the, you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? When it goes, do, 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 and you're like, all you're exciting bits. What, chop into it, do, 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 do. <laughs> I mean, and there's, you see a gypsy, and that's when you're like, crying away. I'm telling you, so you've got different stages for when you reach different songs. And if you get behind, you know you're behind. Ben, you are missing a trick, my friend. I'm telling you. Yeah. There's a Fleetwood Mac song for every occasion. They covered all bases. Deep all music. right. I respect that. Well, I'm a, yeah, music in Netflix while I'm cooking. But I'll, I'll try I'll try some Fleetwood. I'll try some yeah, Fleetwood. Try Love a bit of Fleetwood. I've got quite an eclectic taste in music, actually. I like a bit of all sorts. I do. But no, but you know what? When you're cooking, it's different. It's a different stage in your mind you need. You know, like, you want it to be chill, but you want it to be still, like, a bit absent about it. Well, and some people, see, you've got different cooks, haven't you? Because some people, like, take it really seriously and follow recipes. I am definitely not a recipe follower. I'm a bit of, cook it in, see what it feels like. So I mean? Yeah, experiment. And if, if in doubt, if it tastes like crap, add butter. Because <laughs> it makes everything taste better. Like, if it's cereal. If you add butter, it'll make everything taste better. What, even cereal? Oh, cereal. There's no tr nutritional value in cereal. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, uh, t are you ready for this being a presenter and segueing it then? I no. hear that uh, <laughs> uh, homegrown veg has nutritional value. <gasps> I mean, who knew that I'm actually a bloody good gardener? Yeah, so get me into this, because I write like this, like, so is it proper therapeutic, and how, how are you getting involved? I'm going to take you to meet them, are you ready? Yeah. I feel like Anna Karais. Okay. <laughs> I used to look like her as a child. <laughs> uh, I did, I had really long hair. Hang on, I don't know how to turn it round. Can you do it? Oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah well played. There it, is, there it is, look at that. Here we go, look at these. So this is 17 days. It's amazing, isn't it? Do, do the sort of, like... Is it every day you see a gradual change or is there a day yeah. where it just shoots and you're like, whoa. So these guys, these were cool jets and these just came all of a sudden. But, <laughs> so my stepdad, Brian, has told me to put them outside to harden them off. That is an actual term. Put them outside to harden them off so they get used to being outside. So I've put them outside and they've got a bit blown about. <laughs> so um, I don't you know brought about, them back. I'm not sure about hardened off. A little bit, they're a little bit wonky now, but anyway, they'll be all right. The back inside, it was like, <laughs> like we've um, I think we've created a bit of a wind tunnel, you know, like Bridgewater Place in Leeds. Oh, I mean, of course, yeah, a bit like that in our garden where, where we've put an extension now. So, um, anyway, they were in the wind tunnel for a bit, getting hardened off, but yeah, it's exciting. I love it, and they're from seed as well. Like, I don't know, but I'll tell you my secret. Here's my secret. I tell them all the time how clever they are. <laughs> I'm literally morphing into my mother. And um, I, I play um, healing music all night. Yeah, but do you know what, right? So frequencies of music do have different healing traits. It's so true. And also, right, there was a science experiment that was done in Japan where they were really angry to ice cubes, right? And then they were really like nice to ice cubes. Okay. And when they uh, used the telescope to uh, look in, look into the, the size of them, like they were proper beautiful, like um, symmetrical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a science experiment done by a Japanese, um, a Japanese scientist called Emoto, I think. And you can find it on YouTube. It's absolutely fascinating. And what's really interesting about that particular experiment is, and you can like you can do it with plants and all sorts, right? There's one on YouTube at the minute where school kids in America, they got two plants and they put them in the in the classroom, and then every morning the kids would come in 
and they'd be like, Ugh! to one of them, and they'd be like, oh, you're beautiful, to the other, right? And the one that got told how awful it was, it just, like, withered and died. And then the one that was told how great it was, like, flourished. So I don't care if I'm a little bit batshit crazy. I am talking to my plants, and they are growing, and I'm going to feed the whole street. <laughs> yeah, but because it works. But, the, but do, you know, do you know what, though, right? I really see those as a, a symbolic exercise of how we speak to people, how we speak to ourselves internally. Because I, I think that I never knew it about plants as much. Um, but I, when I when I looked at icicles, sorry, when, when I looked at icicles, obviously that's water, and we're like sixty percent water. So if it works in that paradigm, it would work for us. It's, so there's um, a guy called Bruce Lipton. Like you need to check him out, Bruce Lipton. He wrote a book called The Biology of the Leaf, and he's on like YouTube and stuff. Anyway, so what he he used to study cells, he was a scientist, he, uh, and he was a, a lecturer at MIT or something, anyway. And what he discovered is he would study stem cells, and he totally discovered that um, a stem cell, if you put a stem cell, which is um, a cell that you get from a, like a, a, an umbilical cord, is a stem cell, so you don't know what it's going to create into. And he found that it was dependent on what the environment was, depended on what the cell became, which means that you are a product of your environment. And so what's really interesting when you start to unpack that concept is like you've got the ability to, you've got the ability to change your environment because your environment, you can't change where you were born, right? You can't change that. You can't change what family you were born into. You, you can't change a lot of stuff, but there are things that you can change and there are things that you can make better so you can choose what you put into you. So you can choose the friends that you have around you. You can choose um, whether you choose to read crappy magazines or whether you choose to read interesting stuff, whether you choose to watch Friends on Netflix perpetually or if you watch, you know, interesting stuff on YouTube. It's, you've got, like, everybody's got a choice. Um, you genuinely have a choice in life. And but that choice is impactful, not just on our physical, but our actual... Yeah, our actual DNA almost, our makeup. As well, I think when you get into, because it's quite interesting, I'm quite fascinated because me and Al are thinking about kids, right? So we don't have kids yet. Um, but we've been thinking about kids, and I've got mates with kids, so I take my hat off to people with children, right? It looks a really hard, like a really hard job. Yeah, well solid. It, it looks really, doesn't it? It's like non-stop. You can't We're not selling it. None of my friends with kids are selling it. Like any of my mates are watching our with kids. You are not selling having kids, mate. Rebecca, Rebecca Chambers, who um, has got the most amazing 15-year-old daughter. Who is a bit yeah, when they're of an age, when they're of like an age, where got, like basically when they're like 18, like, they've moved out and they're all right. Yeah. That's well, pretty I, much it. But I'll tell you what else is different, right? And... Like, you know, the stuff that kids are exposed to now is, is totally, totally different. Hi, Rebecca! Al! <laughs> I like she honestly, dream kid. If you could guarantee an Al, you'd have one tomorrow. But, like, I'm not convinced I'm going to have a kid that chilled out. Anyway, and, but what concerns me about kids is, like, the environment that they are brought up in now, just because of, like, all the social media and the gaming and... Everybody's like seems to be keyboard warriors and stuff, and I'm just not sure that we've got a generation of kids that are prepared, um, like psychologically prepared and are, are strong enough. And I think that's why we've got so much anxiety and um, and that sort of concerns me. So I think me off the back of that, I don't know if it's that you're prepared. I don't think that anyone's really prepared for that side of it. I think it's the actual amount and the influx. Yeah. You know, it's the access. Like if someone were on a boat us at school. They'd have to ring the house phone to be more horrible. Do you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> like, and then like, that came over. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, like, now it's like the, the, they've got you everywhere, really. You know, the, the problem is, is that, so there was um, a friend of mine put a status up, right? And um, somebody commented on it, Kaylee commented on it, and her intention was, she, she just put, you need to drink lots of tea, and it was all about with COVID, whatever. And all of a sudden, everybody just started having a go at her on this status. And I was like, oh, my God, this is everything that is wrong with social media because these people didn't know her from Adam, never met her, didn't understand what her intention was. And if you know Kaylee Stevenson, you know that her intention is to be kind and to be, you know, is, is to be helpful. Her intention wasn't 
Yeah, it was just, and it was this barrage of people didn't even know where I was like, this is absolutely mental. And the problem with social media is that the way people behave behind the keyboard, they, they almost have this, because there's that um, barrier between you and the person, you don't get the empathy. Part of your brain just doesn't kick in. So you wouldn't behave like that if you, you now, met somebody in the street. You wouldn't I, go up. I, I'm sorry. I think you've been too kind. I don't think that they lack the empathy. I just think that they've, they lack the, uh, they've got the uh, immunity. Can you hear me all right? It's crackling a bit. I can, can you hear me fine? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think it's the immunity. I think it's, it's, they wouldn't say it to somebody on the street because they have the immunity, they have the empathy, but it's like, I've got an opinion, I have to be heard. And I heard something interesting the other day that said, no one wants to be right, they want to be first. Yeah, maybe. I think everybody's got a platform. I think everyone's got a platform these days. And I, I just think, God, everybody's just so quick to to pull people down. And I, I think that's a real shame. I just think that the more, look, we're all human beings, right? We're, none of us are perfect. And we've all done stuff that we regret and that we wish we hadn't done. And um, yeah, everybody's got a story and everybody's interesting. I truly believe that. But, you know, we're all just trying to get through this life. And I think, you you know, you kind of have to, I, I just think, you know, we have to be a little bit more accepting and just try and understand where people are coming from. And, you know, when people are really cruel or really mean or react in a certain way, instead of feeling hurt immediately, you know, I think it takes, it takes some doing, but sometimes you've got to elevate yourself and say, well, why would that person behave like that? And what's gone on behind? And if you can kind of elevate yourself and look down on a situation rather than be in a situation, I really think that, um, you know, you, you end up having that strength and that power. Um, and I think a lot of these people's warriors, it is about power that I don't think people feel that they've got power, which I think is such a shame because everybody, like we are magnificent beasts. Every single one of us, like everybody's got power within them, like especially me. <laughs> well, no, no, you, everything you said there, that's why, honestly, why I wanted to speak with you is like, it's always the optimistic level. And I believe I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the same as you, but I think the difference is, is that it's, it's easy to get drawn in to an attack when it feels like a barrage. And I think that in the process of, you know, taking it back to kids and how they are impacted by social media and how we can, you know, because we're learning this together. You know, when you're at school and you've got, oh, don't take streets of strangers, like that's something that the older generations have known. And But this is something that no one knows any sort of hierarchy or template to follow. So I think it, you're right. It's like, how? Why should we be bothered by somebody that doesn't know us? But it's difficult when someone's coming at you. So is there a different process that we can maybe attain and develop together as parents, adults, kids, whoever, through social media, where we we suddenly take our power by distilling the 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 you know. Anything you give attention to, you're giving power to. So if you're reacting to what's coming at you your way, then that's giving that power. If you're not, then you're receding and you're giving yourself that power. So is there a, a platform to be taught in that? Do you know, and, and I think what's really key with this is I'm not saying that you should just shut up and put up and take abuse. So a few years ago, I had a full-on hate campaign set up about me. By, Serious? By a feminist group and called... Uh, so strident, so what? Right. <laughs> and it was, so I was face for Harley Medical when I was tits on a stick back in 2009. And there was like 2,000 posters of me advertising Harley Medical Group. They were toxic tits, just for the record, everybody. I had those PIP. I didn't realise that at the time. Anyway, and um, there was like on the back of a bus in Manchester. Hey. <laughs> and this like the, the company contacted me and they were like, we're really sorry, but um, it seems that there's this hate campaign being set up and they've been defacing my, my pictures in the tubes and putting this is fake, you are not, and all this sort of stuff. And so, you know, it's quite easy to go, oh, just ignore it. But I was like, no, I'm going to tell people that I took my power and I made a decision with my body about what I wanted to do. And so I went on Women's Hour, which was phenomenal my mum and the grandma lives me so it was so proud to have me on like radio for women's hour um and then I, you know i went on the news and talked about it because i felt really really strongly that 
you know, everybody's entitled to, as long as you're not hurting other people, right? Everybody's entitled to do whatever they, they want and what their choice that makes them feel better, as long as it doesn't impact other people. Um, I just don't think that, you know, like my intention was not to get my boobs done to make everybody else feel crap about themselves. That wasn't my intention. My intention was to make myself feel better. Um, and I took my power and my choice and my money and off I went and did it. Um, and I felt really strongly about that point. And so I... How old were you at this time? No, Al, so I was 27. 27, yeah. So it was quite exciting. Um, <laughs> I can't be honest with you. Yeah, so, they, so that sort of happened at... And it was, you know, it was quite early, like 2009 social media hadn't been around for a long time but um you know I, I sort of it goes back to what I said about every we've got a power where we can make a choice and we all have the ability to choose like I, I always think you can't choose where you were born right but you can choose where you die um and every single you can choose how you react to things so when I got diagnosed with breast cancer in 2013 that wasn't my choice right trust me would not have chosen that particular card but that was the hands that I got dealt, right? And so sometimes in life, you get dealt a shit hand. That is just the way it is. And you've just got to, you, you, you either choose to go out of the game or, or play your hand. And, but you've got that choice. You, you have got the choice. It is your choice how you react to something. And that's not always rolling over and letting somebody tickle your belly. But it is sometimes, you know, understanding where this hatred or where this anger comes from and trying to, Trying to, you know, it's not even pity. It's sometimes just being empathetic with people and, um, you know, recognising not, not everybody's the same. And that's the fruit of life, isn't it? That everybody's different. Um, but it, you have got the power, you have got the ability to, you know, to, to make your own life and to feed your brain with good stuff and feed your body with good stuff and surround yourself with good people. Which like then goes back to what we were saying about the plants and then that nurtures yourself in in being in there. But but on, 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 on the back of what you just said there, do you feel that um, it was more the the angle that you took to combat it? Because if you would have battled them on Facebook with, say, replying to all the comments and stuff, it wouldn't have really got very far. You'd have drained yourself. You in at the news level, baby. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, but do you know what I'm saying, though? But that's real talk, isn't it? It's like you're going to have more of an impact by... Have putting your voice being heard rather than just getting into a bickering battle online which is going to drain you and, and not really be seen and i think that that was the point so after i did my little bit on on the radio and on look north and what have you it continued but i felt that i'd taken my position i'd said my piece i'd fought my corner and that was that and do you know what sometimes you've just got to draw a line in the sand and say i've done it move on not um, only, sorry, not only draw draw a line, but not get drawn into it again. Because then what is your battle? Then what is it? Then it becomes a bit more ego. Then it becomes a bit more, I know more than you. Whereas yeah. what you wanted to do was speak from your heart to put your point across, which is completely fair, and stand your ground. And then whatever is everyone else's like. It becomes, God, how sad are they that they're spending their entire life attacking some woman from Leeds that they've never even met for, for a decision that she made that had nothing to do with them. And which, is, which is ironically, the reason why they're attacking you is because you're making people, in their eyes, look yeah. feel less. Mate, eh. it was like, head blown, hang on a minute, you should be backing me up. I yeah, yeah. Them. Oh my God, anyway, no, they didn't, they hated me for it. <laughs> but you can't, do you know what, right? The other thing that I really believe is that not everybody's going to like you, and that is all right, okay? That, like, not everybody's going to... There will be a lot of people that find me quite challenging and find me very annoying. Um, but that's all right as well. You know, you just, you just shouldn't beat yourself up. Don't be mean to people, but, you know, you, yeah, I, I don't worry too much about... Like, I worry about the people that care, and, and don't worry too much about the ones that don't because for every one hater that you've got in this world you've got 100 people that love you that is that's just that is just physics mate do you know what i mean it's just the way it is so <laughs> don't get hung up it's like i got really upset by caroline flash right because she was absolutely beautiful she had everything going for her she was absolutely amazing but she got hung up on the small percentage that really got to her and, and that's it concerns me to stuff like that because I think 
suicide's a massive, massive thing, especially with men as well. Men don't talk as much as women, but you know, people are getting affected by what's going on. Um, and I just wonder if there are things that we can do, certainly as wanting to be a parent myself, you know, trying to instill coping mechanisms and, you know, trying to get my kids to, to see things from another viewpoint and, um, you know, to, to kind of kill people with, with your kindness a little bit and try and understand that these people, that not everyone's going to like you and that's okay. Like, you've just got to get on with that. Um, but there are going to be, you know, some people out there that, uh, I'm just really unhappy and this is the only way that they can get themselves out and quite often when people are really gobbing off about you it's a reflection of themselves and you have just got to almost pity that if people are really quick to have a comment about somebody they've never met I just think it's, I just think it's really sad uh, there are certain celebrities like that absolutely boil my piss don't get me wrong I don't watch them I don't engage with them and I think that's what you want to do you know Fair play to you. I'm not going to begrudge anybody doing what they want to do. They don't affect me. Um, but I can't watch them. And I, but I would never comment on it. I just, I, I just think it's unnecessary. Like, who, who cares what Claire Scott thinks? Apart from you. Ah, <laughs> the inspiration behind behind loose lips. Of course. Yeah. How, how do you feel we roll this out into public? I don't know. I, I, do you know, again, going back to that guy I was telling you, Bruce Lipton. So he's fascinating. He talks about children and he says that um, babies, when they're born up until about the age of seven, their brain waves are in, I can't remember which one it is. <laughs> it's the hypnosis, I think it's theta. So the brain waves of a child up to the age of seven is in a hypnosis state, which means, because that's how babies, human babies learn because they look at what you do. So they copy and they learn. And so everything that you do between the age of zero to seven is a belief that you instill within your children. And it's how beliefs come about. It's how people gain religions. No babies are born with religions, but their beliefs are built. It's how people, um, you know, learn how to turn a tap off, learn how not to put their hands in the fire, all that sort of stuff. That is stuff because babies that are born in a hypnotic state. And so if, if we think about that as parents going forward, you know, what can we do to instill really strong beliefs into our kids and, and just get some really good stuff going in there? I think, you know, again, it all comes back to you choose what you put into your kids. You choose what, you know, what you've got a real responsibility as a, as a parent. Like you're, you're building something and someone that's going to go out into the world. That is a responsibility, um, a massive responsibility. It's your responsibility to put good stuff into that kid. Um, so I think it's got to start. What do we do with the people like my age that? That's you know, what. That's where I was going to lead. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm all sort of looking at it from that angle. I think that uh, people are feeling a bit lost and uh, disenfranchised and unconnected to anything. Like, how do we, how do we instill what we believe think, to be to be common practice into it? I think it all starts with trying to switch away from negative influence. Like, I really believe that for the minute you are concerned, like, I'm not watching the news about the whole COVID-19 at the minute, because but like, it doesn't matter whether I watch it or not. It makes zero zip. The only thing that I can do is stay at home. Right? That's the one thing I can control. I can't do anything else. I can't stop next door going out all the time or the kids snogging on the field. I, just, I can't stop it, right? So, so I'm not watching negative stuff because there's no point control the controllables, control what you can control, um, and don't sweat the stuff that you can't. And I think what we've got is we've got a society that, um, or a culture of fear that has been bred. I, I really believe that. Um, and I, I'm not downplaying what's happening at the minute because I do think it's really, really serious. But at the same time, you know, let's not be frightened of it. Let's, you know, learn from it. What are the amazing things that are going to come out off the back of it? Yes, there's going to be a lot of tragedy, don't get me wrong. And, you know, I know people that have got very frightened and it is um you know it's scary times but i think we need to in everything there's a lesson in in everything there is there is a lesson so i think the first thing in terms of going back to the social media the first thing that that i would recommend is just don't don't consume negative stuff like remove i remember somebody said to me when i got breast cancer an um, amazing woman called wendy absolutely batshit crazy she had breast cancer married to a builder like me and um, amazing i worked with her she was an estate agent and she said to me, remove all negative influences when you're going through this. And it just was the first thing I did. I was like, right, who are the shit bastards? <laughs> Drip my mouth. Not answer the phone to those. Um, 
and just by having that that one tiny tweak, that one change of doing looking at things positively, it sets off a chain reaction. So you can either choose to sit and watch all the negative stuff that's happening at the moment, or you can start to think about what all, all the good stuff is that's going to come out of it. So people are likely going to have a better work-life balance because people are going to say, no, I'm going to work from home more. We're going to have a better understanding of how to deal with you know, epidemics and, and pandemics like this in the future. People are spending time. All of a sudden, everybody stopped. There's self-care going on. People are learning. To, you know, So you can choose to look at it and, and go down on a downward, downward spiral, or you can look at it on from a positive. So I think the first thing, in terms of people being able to cope with social media, is if everybody gets out of that negative mindset, if everybody gets into a positive mindset and starts looking at this world as it is. I mean, it's like life is really precious, really precious. And I'm, I'm in a position that I can say that because I nearly lost my life at 31. Um, and frankly, every single day that I live is a booty bonus because um, I shouldn't be here. I really shouldn't be here. <laughs> it's time to me off all day. That, that deserved a proper tip at that. It's right though, isn't it? So, you know, I'm already dead. So like, for me, I'm living every single day and it is a miracle that, and, and I live in this blessed position in that I can see that life is, life is incredible. Um, and you have really got to just be really, really positive because if you get into a negative mindset, it is, Really, really easy just to go down and I think if people start looking at things from a positive mindset and um, then you know you start to see things in a different light and um, you know you can just say I'm not interested in the bullshit and you can remove it um, and you can be all right with yourself for doing that you say no I, I, I don't agree with that that's not in my belief system and you, you know you become comfortable at moving these things aside and you take your power back honestly living in a positive mindset and trying to find a silver lining in everything. It's, it's an absolute game changer. <laughs> I'm absolutely, you know, I, it really is a game changer because you get to choose. You get to choose. You've got the power. Every single person. Like, it blows my mind because I remember I had a, a coach of mine, so a public speaking coach, Andy Harrington, very highly recommended. Um, I remember he said these words, right? He said, why is everyone trying so hard to fit in when you were born to stand out? <sighs> Do you know what I mean? I'm like, everybody... Mate, that rewind that. If that were Jay-Z, I'd be getting a wheel up or something, mate. If that were Kane or a, a rave, that'd be a wheel up. Like, drop that bar again. Amazing. Yeah, it's true. So why... No, no, no. <laughs> drop that bar again. Say that bar again. Share that with us again. So that is... Why are you trying so hard to fit in when you were born to stand out? Wait, you know what that deserves? That drop! That, that deserves a lighter, mate. <laughs> That's a lighter, that. It's First not... lighter at day. First lighter at day. Oh, wow. I've got a hat to. I feel like I've had a Paul Hollywood handshake here. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that was sick. No, it's true. And it was like something that really resonated with me um, about finding your voice and finding your power because that is... Like, we're all different and we should celebrate everyone's differences. Um, because you couldn't have a room full of Claire Scott, it'd be a nightmare. Just, you know what I mean? So you should celebrate. And I think when people take that power back and start living in a positive mindset and recognising that, you know, life isn't always going to be easy, but life is about contrast. You can't have happy days all the time. The minute you accept that, the, the easier it becomes because... The tough times, the times when life is, is not working with you, it can feel like it's all getting on top of you. But I guess you have to trust that the universe has put you in that place. So you, you are exactly where you're supposed to be right now. And if things are getting tough, it's because you need to have conflict life. Because how can you appreciate the good times and the ups if you have never experienced the down? And also, you know, if you're not on the right path, if you're not doing the right things, but you're comfortable... And things are awkward, you're not going to ever move on. So when you feel that conflict, you need to embrace it and you need to stop and say, right, okay, things are not good. I'm stressed. I'm not in the right place here. Things that have to be like this, what can I change to make it better? And that's your power, again, because you get to choose. You get to choose with everything that you do. You know, this, this is your life. And, and once you start taking that power back, it becomes, it becomes easy. You surround yourself with amazing people. You start reading cool stuff. 
and and good things just ha start to happen it's like frequencies we were talking about that earlier like frequencies whatever you put out i truly believe you get back tenfold and uh, you know you just if you put shit out you're gonna get shit back it's as, it's as simple as that just, just on that then right because you brought us to a perfect point where I, I can sort of segue back to what you revealed about your cancer. Obviously, you didn't put that out to get that, but you're still a firm believer that what you put out, you get back. But so, so as firstly, that, that's an interesting angle because you've also said you put in situations that the universe puts you in to, to show your power. And one sort yeah. of common theme that's running through this, which is really passionate and powerful, is that we are to reclaim our power and, and that, that is an amazing thing. But I want to sort of end with this question, not end, but wrap up this bit with this question and then lead into, you know, the, the cancer side of it, if you're cool with that, is when you found out that you had it, how did you balance not reading the negativity about it because sure, that's all there is, as opposed to looking into it in a way that you, you could still learn about the condition of it, but still remain in a positive, like, manner, if you know what I mean. Totally get it. So, um, I, I've known my friend Chloe is on the earth. Hi, Chloe! Yeah, um, you're getting a lot of love, you know, honestly. You're getting a lot of, you're getting a lot of, Laura Store. Shout out, Laura Store. If you knew me before, I was really, had, I've always been quite headstrong, to be fair. Um, but I was really a bit of a workaholic, and... I, want, I worked really hard, right? I was a grafter. I worked really, really hard all the time. Um, but the reason I did it was for status. It was for money. I wanted the big house. And it was all to prove everybody how brilliant I was, right? So that, that's genuinely, that's me having done some soul searching and looking back. And then all of a sudden, boom, 31, breast cancer um, in my right breast and in, in my lymph nodes. I didn't ask for it. But the first thing that I said was, am I going to be able to work through this? Because <laughs> I went into, logical brain went into it. Um, and I very quickly realised that um, it was quite serious, and um, I just, I just had this innate belief that, that. And I remember, I remember Chloe, bless her, when I told Chloe, and she was just so frightened. She was so frightened, and I was like, "That is not an option." I just put my hands on her face, and I felt it. And with every single cell in my body, I just thought, "This is not it. Um, this is not." This is not my time. And do, you, do, you, do you put that down to your gut? Do you put that down to just a, a belief? Do you put it down to, obviously, things you've looked into after where you now know that it was almost mine over? Like, what do you put that down to? Just a bit of an ass. I was like, no way. I'm not done. I am not done, and I'm not having cancer take, take it away from me. And, and I said, I only cried three times throughout my entire cancer life. Uh, the first time I cried was when they told me that my hair was going to fall out and I wouldn't be able to probably have children. Um, but thankfully I had IVF, which is cool. Um, so we've got like babies, ice babies, snow babies, which is cool. Um, the second time I cried was when my hair started falling out and I went to pick my wig up. And this is, this is the power thing that got me talking. It was a woman called Angela Amazing Morley um, wig place. She was a phenomenal woman. And when I went to pick up this wig, the only time I wore it was once when I picked it up. And she said to me, take back your power, go home, shave your head and do it because you want to, not because cancer's making you. And it was that mindset shift of, I'm taking the power back with this. This is me. And so, of course, Ali Scott did the hair for me. And he, like, shaved it, like, all off at the front and left it at the back. And it was like, do you know what I mean? Business at the front party down the back. And just... <laughs> but we, we did it. And we, I look great with skinhead, by the way, as well. Like, amazing. Um, yeah. And how, so how, sorry, how, how, how was that? Because, you know, there's, there's the stages of appearance of, of, of the impacts of the treatment, I, I, I suppose. Like, how, how were these different stages when, when you were facing them and going through them? Well, at first, so the one term that, so the second time I cried was when I had that wig on my hair. When I say my hair was falling, like literally, like rat tails, like clumps. Um, and so I knew it was all going to come out. So when I first shaved it, I actually looked a bit like G.I. Jane. Well, <laughs> mint, right? I did. I, I quite suited it. And then Jenny Fulis came and like, did my eyebrows for me and had big like hoop earrings. And everyone was like, oh, are you really? Are you poorly? Are you sure? Um, <laughs> and that was cool. And then... And I never, ever wore my wig. I've never worn it again. In fact, the last time it was worn was when Ali Scott put it on to pretend to be Professor Snape. 
for uh, Vic Dunford's um, Hendy picture. So, uh, so it's never been worn. And that, again, that's because I choose to put really good people around me. So I chose to have, you know, the, I had around me, they, were, they saved my life. They were like my medicine. And they gave me, they empowered me to never once felt weird with having no hair. And actually, as the chemo kicked in, when you first shave it all off, you've still got your little, you know, your little dimples or whatever, and you can see where the, the hair would have been. But as time progressed, I literally looked like a human thumb. That's what it looked like. I had no eyebrows, no eyelashes. Like, all hair goes from everywhere, which is useful. In <laughs> 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 so I'd do, like, I, I sent a video, like a Snapchat to everybody, pretending I was Humpty Dumpty and, like, my head was an egg. And so, I don't know, you've just got to tackle these things with humour and I also innately knew that how I behaved and how I reacted to it would impact everybody else and I, I really do believe it is easier for the person that's going through it because you're kind of on this uh, you've got everybody that dives in and everybody's giving you love and attention and, and, and everything and, and but for the person watching it's hard it must be really hard and you know I was very acutely aware of it being difficult for other people to, to see me and I just wanted people I, you know I was still Claire I just had my hair it was a little bit chunkier <laughs> um, but I was just I had this I had this belief I, I lost my belief once and we, <laughs> I um I did everything with with my cancer um literally and my sisters because I was diagnosed a week before my wedding so I had a sister that lived in Australia and one in, in New Zealand and they flew back in for my wedding and then bless them they never went home um, and they just cared. They were amazing, literally amazing. And we had all this like mad shit that went on. It was just like synchronicities and like getting hold of cannabis oil. That was that was the weirdest thing ever. So were, were you into your spirituality in the universe at that point, or were it almost like it, it found you in a way? A, a little bit. I, do you know? I, I really think that. Cancer has been my, it's been my, my life lesson and it has, it's shown me what's important because, you know, I don't, I, I really, I don't judge or value um, money or status anymore. I, I couldn't give two hoots about it. Honestly, I couldn't. I think what's really important in life are the connections that you make and the legacy that you leave and the impact that you have. That's what's important. That's what goes with you. You know, you could be the, the richest person in the, in the graveyard and it means absolutely nothing. It means nothing. Um, you know, and cancer really taught me that. Cancer got me to really look at my life and say, what have I done? That, that, how have I impacted? What, what have I done that, that's made a change? What, what impact have I had? And has my life been worthwhile? And, you know, I, I, you know, we had some fun and all the rest of it, but have I actually made an impact? Have I... Had I had a positive impact in this world, and at that point, I don't think I particularly have. But had I not have been poorly, I'd never have seen that, and I'd have carried on being a dick and being a bit of an ass. Do, do you know, just to follow on with what you've just said there, and sort of cover the current climate, but then I suppose bring it back to what we're discussing is, I feel that what we're going through at the moment, um, as much as it is a pandemic, I think that it's really stripped any status. Like, it, this... It doesn't care about stature, name, race, gender, anything. And so we're all we're all we're all on a we're all on a same plane playing field, you know. We're all and I, I pray that that really shines out of this when we get through it, and you know we've got through it together in the same situation, and we can see that inner resilience and that that human endeavor and that human spirit that that has got us through. But I'd, I'd like to bring it back to what you were just discussing because when when I look at moments in my life like dark times, I almost get a bit cagey at them and it took me a while to be able to face them. I'm proud that I've got through them and I'm, I'm proud to discuss them to help other people get through them. But I'm almost like as if I was there because I'm here now. I'm like almost in two places with it. But then I'm like, well, that person there got me to who I am here so it's more of a personal endearment as a, as a sense of reflecting quite a lot when I when I when I perform my comedy I speak about stuff because it's very cathartic and I feel like that's that's when I'm able to release and stuff but 
when you speak about you know your cancer and your illness there's almost like a glow to you there's almost like a, a, such a nut beat it's not like oh yeah but and, you know it, it, it's really like oh, the way that you sort of i can tell how you're describing the situation shows how you went through it it's not like uh, a draining reaction do you know what i mean but like i really feel like you not just not sorry it's not just how you reflect on it it's how you went through it and, and i agree i think it was just really fast. like i had this like paradigm shift of, of what was important all of a sudden when somebody says you've got a 30 percent chance of making it and a 70 percent chance that you're going to pop your clogs you know all of a sudden what like it brings it to you straight away and you go this is you know what's real and what's what's important and so you know i i think it was a blessing not a like not a bad thing um and you you know everybody around me like the people i had around me were amazing and in the whole i had a whole year off work and in the whole year there was only two days from ali going to work and getting home where i saw nobody like everybody just, you know, Parveen would turn up with vats full of magic water for me that, like, this ionised water. It's like every other day she'd turn up, Jenny Hughes would sit and paint her nails, Kay Bastable. Every single time I had my chemo, she was there and she cooked for me. Trish and Aaron would make me stuff. Amanda would come around and feed me stuff when I couldn't get off. Like, oh my God, like, Chloe would come and see me every single week. It was just, honestly, these people are amazing. I have my best mate Giovanna coming through, they brought the kids to see me. It was like everybody just went woof. And I had this sense of, you know, you know, I was really blessed, which is why I have this, this sense of purpose to give back into the world now because I, I genuinely believe my friends were mates were my, my medicine, that they got me through it and they, you know, they embraced me and they allowed me to, to be me. And it's just, it was like a seismic shift, it really was. Um, and so, yeah, I do agree with you. And I think it's interesting to hear you saying that, you know, the comedy is quite cathartic and that going back over the dark places, I had um, the, the chemo did some damage to my heart. And I remember just going a bit, my head went down a bit. And it was actually Aaron said to me, Trish's husband said to me, why don't you write a blog? And I started writing this blog and I did it with comedy, right? And it is, it's clarascott.wordpress.com. Um, and I did it with, with comedy. And it is a way of, you know, if you lighten the load on a, on a deep and dark issue, it, it kind of invites other people to accept it and understand it a bit better. And I think that's really important for you when you're up on stage because, you know, people can identify through comedy far better than somebody. It's like, what do you do with somebody who's that woe is me all the time? And it's, hard, it's hard work. No, it is. I but, but, but it's understandable. I think it's understandable. And I think that's the difference. I think if you would have been the other way, no one could have been, oh, she's been like that again. Like, you know, I think, you know what I mean? But, but, but I, I think it's the, it's the endeavour of the spirit of yourself, man. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, honestly, like, it's so powerful. It is. I know we don't, like, get to connect that much. But one of the, like, you honestly inspired this because, like, that chat that we had is one of the most inspiring chats. It is, mate. Like, I just, and even this has as well. And I, do you, are you still, obviously, now that you're, um, you, you're all cleared and everything, are you still involved in the world? Like, you know, I really think, like, I could see you as a life coach, mate. Honestly, I could see you like as a Tony Robbins or something. Well, I um, I still support people. So people reach out to me all the time on Facebook and what have you. So I still support people that are going through cancer at the moment, which I love to do. I just love to, you know, to talk to people. There was, um, I had a dog on the step to me and I sent pictures of, because I've got three smiles. I've got a smile there and two smiles where my tits were as well. So I've, I've got three smiles. <laughs> um, so I've sent pictures of myself to, the, to a couple of girls that, um, was panicking about what it was going to be like and just wanted to be honest. Um, yeah, so I I want to be able to, to help people. At the minute, my giving back is I work with an amazing charity in Harrogate called Supporting Older People and I support um, older people that are lonely. Um, so that's, that's my way of giving back to, to my community. I've got three women, they're all totally different um, and they're all amazing, by the way, as well, I love them all. So that, that's my way of giving back. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to do was I wanted to 
design a bra for people that have mastectomies because let me tell you something like they make these prosthetics right so they make um, prosthetic boobs that look and feel like tits i'm like babe i don't want anybody squeezing these <laughs> do you know what i mean like why that is just weird i just want my clothes to look normal but i'm so far into it now i don't even know where tits sit anymore do you know what i mean it's like I have literally no idea. I have no idea. I've had to get rid of most of my prosthetics because I kept losing them and then they'd be like mismatched boobs. And oh, anyway, it was, it was quite traumatic to be quite <laughs> But I just, yeah, I think I do want to give back. Um, I've just changed career. So I went straight back into sales after I was poorly. Um, and again, I've always been like a high flyer and at the universe put me in a position. So I got what I thought was my dream job in September. Um, and I was loving it and it just, it just didn't work out. Um, they wanted me to be back down in London. That wasn't going to be an option. And I went from having this amazing job to all of a sudden you either move back down to London or you've got no job. And I was like, oh my God. But being able to look at that from a, um, a different viewpoint and say, okay, so what, what is the lesson here? What's the silver lining? And the silver lining was, I've just changed my career. And interesting, you say life coach. I'm now a business coach for estate agents. And I love it. I really love it. I get to, you know, inspire and motivate and coach people to, to be the best version of themselves. And, you know, so, yeah. So, yeah, I could be a life coach. <laughs> no, you are a life coach, mate. Honestly, everybody who's watching this now is locked in. Like, honestly, mate, you're a breath of fresh air. Like, it's ridiculous. It, it, it's staggering. It, it just blows my mind, honestly. Every time I speak to you and it's not like you're making light of what happened. It's like you've just been so real with what's happened. It's authentic. And it's like the way that you've gone at it, like, you know, the way that you keep saying you've recaptured your power, you've reclaimed your power. We feel that, mate. You know what I mean? Regardless of what you've overcome, like, everything that you say is felt like it's I believe, felt. I believe it. I believe, I honestly believe it. I believe each and every one of us has got the ability to to, to like Tony Robbins say something this, and it's like this was not a hard moment for me and he said it is in our moments of decision that our destiny is changed right and I was like oh my god what does that mean let's unpack that that means that in a heartbeat you can change your life and you can say no I'm not going to do this or no I'm not going to I'm not going to accept that or no I'm not going to keep on with a corporate high powered high pressured sales job no I'm going to do what what makes my heart sing and you, you know, you can, you can choose, you, you choose you, in that moment, you can, you know, you can make those decisions. So, yeah, take power back, babe, because we're all magnificent beasts. You know what, mate, I've got another chat to do at seven, but I'm going to book you back in for another chat because, like, you are a legend, honestly. And the comments are going off. I know, like, everyone's, like, properly, like, loving you, but you are, mate, like, you are, like, you're an inspiration, like not only what you've gone through, but just the manner and the demeanor that you, you deal with it and speak about it and own it, mate. Like it's, you know, it, it really puts a lot into perspective of what issues are there and how we should face issues if you can. Yeah, oh, lasses are asking if you're on, Jim. Oh, it's, um, so... <laughs> Because it's posh Alka Pops, it's from Sainsbury's, it's gin, it's rhubarb and ginger, and it's divine. But I've only had half of it. <laughs> well, my love, honestly, like, let's reconnect, let's look to get another, like, chatting. And uh, you calling, you calling is to be a life coach, mate. Like, there are hundreds of people who, there's billions of people, what about hundreds? There's bloody billions, there's billions of people. Lockdown. Come on, let's get these lips out there. No, but honestly, mate, the way that you think, like, we need to work out a way of how more people can see and feel what you're saying because it just makes the most beautiful sense in such a endearing and truthful and life learned lesson way. And yeah. it's in, it's incredible. And not only do you help claim back your power, you give other people power. So thank you for being involved. Ah, uh, mate, you're a sweetheart, honestly. Say hello to Wally. And uh, I'll message you and uh, we'll, we'll arrange another chat because I don't even think we've touched the surface. Let's do that. That sounds like fun. I'm going to go and have another cheeky little gin. Why not? Why not indeed? You take care, my love. Stay I'll... safe, stay cool. And uh, I'll message you and we'll get another one locked in. Amazing. Lovely catching up. Bye, Ben. Bye. 
So yeah, uh, wow. I'm almost in tears there, man. Like she's just, she's a prolific, beautiful, angelic soul, isn't she? Like this whole project, when it came to my mind, uh, Loose Lips, she inspired it because we had an amazing chat when a couple of our mates, Kez and um, Amy got married and she gave me a lift back and um, from York to Leeds and it was one of the most profound chats I've ever had. And ever since then, I've just always buzzed off how positive and upbeat she is. So that's why Loose Lips came about. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to reach out and chat to her. And then I'm now reaching out to other people to chat to spread joy, love, vibes through this time to get us through, but also to remind us how beautiful we are. So thank you, Claire Scott. I'll be chatting with you soon. Thank you, everybody who tuned in. Shout out, Laura. You were well engaged. I respect that. Respect Vic. Everybody else who joined in, thank you so much. Stay cool. Stay safe. We will get through this. And uh, yeah, man, if you want to stick about, I'm going to switch off this one and then start another live um, with my boy Liddell, who's another interesting character. So uh, get involved. But stay safe, stay cool. Peace.